All right, let's continue our discussion of limits. We've talked so far about what a limit is and how you find it by looking at a graph. And now we want to discuss how do you find it by just looking at the function itself. Um, as I talked about in the previous video, 99% of limits um, are just the value of the function. All right, if you're looking at a graph, um, almost always, if x is 5, you substitute 5 into that function and you get the limit as x approaches 5. The problem is that um, even though that's true 99% of the time, that's only true for a very small portion of the problems you will solve because that's just too easy. It's not worth making problems about. So in a typical book or, or an AP exam, your limits are going to not be those typical ones. But let's just start with substitution, meaning the, the 99%, the well-behaved functions You know, like polynomials, um, most trig functions, square root functions, as long as we're talking about where they're defined, most typical functions, the limit is just substituting in. Um, I don't want you to see a fraction like this first example, see a rational function and think, oh, something's got to be messed up here. Because the only place that this function is, quote, messed up is at the vertical asymptote at negative 1. Because negative 1 is the value that makes the bottom 0. I'm subbing in positive 1 which means I can just substitute in. You should always try first, even though it, won't, it will rarely be a success. You should try to just substitute in that number, in this case a 1, to the top and the bottom and see what you get. And that will be the limit if you don't find some sort of undefined expression. When I substitute a 1, I get 1 squared plus 1 plus 2 on the top, and I get 1 plus 1 on the bottom. There's nothing wrong with this expression. The top is 1 plus 1 plus 2, or 4. The bottom is 1 plus 1 is 2. So the limit is 2. Now, we'll get to some where we're going to factor and cancel, and that this is what happens when you have holes or asymptotes. But this is not the asymptote. That happens at negative 1. Second example, I don't want you to see trig and think, oh, something's got to be fishy. If you can substitute in pi over 2 into this expression, which would just look like this, sine of pi over 2 plus 1, and sine is not sine is a well-behaved function. You know, you've got trigs and secants, or excuse me, tangents and secants and graphs that have asymptotes, um, and they can get weird. But there's nothing wrong with sine. It just oscillates back and forth forever. You can substitute in any number you want into sine. Its domain is all real numbers. So sine of pi over two. Remember, pi over two is the top of our unit circle, right up here. The sine there is the y value, which is one. So 1 plus 1 makes 2. All right, so these are two examples of well-behaved functions where we can just substitute in the x value where we're trying to find the limit and don't have to do any special strategies. Okay, the first special strategy is going to be factoring. Um, most of the time, this is where if we were looking at the graph, it would have a hole in it. Um, and you create a hole in a graph by taking a well-behaved function and multiplying it on top and bottom by some expression that creates that hole. And you can find that hole by factoring. Um, if I take this expression, if I try to sub in negative 3 right now, I'm going to get 0 over 0. All right, try that just to confirm. But that's, if I just sub in directly, 0 over 0. This is called indeterminate. indeterminate form, meaning I can't tell anything. 0 over 0 is not equal to 1. I cannot stress that hard enough. 0 over 0 does not equal 1. Um, what I have to do is factor and cancel. The top is a nice quadratic. It's going to factor to, here's a big hint, x plus 3, because x plus 3 is on the bottom. That's going to be what cancels out. But you don't have to know that to factor the top. And then that makes the top, um, the other factor, x minus 2. All right, so x plus 3 times x minus 2 cancel the factors of x plus 3 and now substitute in the negative 3. As x approaches negative 3, I get negative 3 minus 2 or negative 5. So the limit of this rational function is negative 5. That's the location of the empty hole in the graph that was created by taking the simple line x minus 2 and multiplying it by x plus 3 over x plus 3. Same thing with this second example. 
When I sub in, I get 0 over 0. I just wanted to include this one to remind you of your difference of cubes factoring, something that you learned at some point and might have neglected to remember. x cubed minus 1 factors to x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. You probably learned that in Algebra 2, maybe in Pre-Cal, maybe or maybe not do you remember it at this point, but um, those were things at the time you said, why do I need to know this? Well, here's a reason you needed to know that. Um, so put that back into the front of your brain. We'll cancel those out, and now we can just sub in. Factoring and canceling is very intuitive. You just cancel out and then go back to strategy one, which is just direct substitution. When I sub in that one, I get one squared plus one plus one, and I get a limit of three, all right? Here is a picture of that second example. The graph of x cubed plus or x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1 is just the parabola that has been multiplied by x minus 1 over x minus 1 to create a hole in the graph. But that doesn't affect our limit. As x approaches positive 1, y is approaching 3. And the big fact from our last lesson was I don't care whether the graph has an open circle whether it's undefined, whether it's defined, or whether it's defined at some other point. This is not what this one looks like, but just to recall, it could be defined somewhere else. Completely irrelevant. The only thing that matters is where are these two sides of the graph? Um, to what point are they converging as we get closer and closer to one? All right, the next strategy, which is not quite as easy, in my opinion, as the um, factor and cancel. It's called rationalizing. Normally, you rationalize denominators to make them not equal to zero. Um, that's something you learned a while back. But this rationalizing, I've got this square root that's really messing things up. When I sub in one, or when I sub in zero, I get uh, the square root of one minus one, which is zero over zero. All right, just direct substitution leads me to zero over zero. You should try to substitute in and see what happens every time. But when you get zero over zero, as you will many times, just realize that's not one. I need to go on and find a better strategy. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to rationalize this thing. If I had had this square root minus one on the bottom, the way I would rationalize it, so what I'm going to do here, is multiply by its conjugate. Remember, a conjugate is not an opposite. It is the same expression with a plus instead of a minus. a plus b and a minus b are conjugates. So let's see why that helps. Um, I'm going to need to multiply out on top. Okay, this is um, this entire numerator. Um, if you like the term foil, that's what we're going to do. We're going to foil on top. Um, but this is going to be a difference of two squares. I get the square root of x plus 1 times the square root of x plus 1 which is just x plus 1. All right, the square roots cancel. Then I get plus the square root of x plus 1 minus the square root of x plus 1 minus 1. And this is the beauty of uh, multiplying by conjugate. The O and the I parts of the FOIL process cancel each other out. On the bottom, I'm going to leave it, or leave it factored out. I'm not going to distribute this x just yet. Let's we'll see what happens if I leave it out. But that's just the original bottom times that conjugate that I multiplied top and bottom. So if I clean this up a little bit, I've got x plus 1 minus 1, which is just x on top. This plus 1 and this minus 1 um, will cancel each other out, leaving me with just an x. And on the bottom, I have x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. And by leaving that factored out at the bottom, I can see my next cancel. Those two x's will go away. And I'm left with the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over square root of x plus 1 plus 1. And now this, when I sub in, I'm not going to get... 0 over 0 anymore. The top is 1. When I sub into the bottom, I get the square root of 1 plus 1, or 2. 
So the limit of this function as x approaches 0 is 1 half. I cannot see that in the way it was written originally. Okay? Because in the original version, it's, what I do know is that this function is undefined at 0. Because when I sub in 0, I get 0 in the denominator, which is a no-no. But I can't see this hidden limit of 1 half within that process until I rationalize, cancel a bunch of stuff out, and get it into a form where it's okay to sub in and not get an indeterminate. And here's a picture of that last one, the square root of x plus 1 minus 1. As I approach 0, right here's the open circle, but you can see my height is at 0.5 or 1 half. All right? I'm just showing you these pictures so you can get an idea um, while, while you're learning. You won't see this picture. You need to be able to do this analytically or algebraically, but I just want to reinforce what's going on by showing you the pictures. Okay, our next strategy is going to be a couple um, of um, special limits that you just need to memorize. Um, when you hear uh, the phrase two special trig limits, which is how a lot of calc books put it, they're referring to these two. Um, they can be proved with what's called the squeeze theorem, and we can talk about that um, at another time. You can look it up. It's, you can, it's easy to find. But if I just try to sub in 0 to this top function, I get the sine of 0 over 0. The sine of 0 is 0, so 0 over 0. Now, I've been telling you that 0 over 0 is not equal to 1. It's indeterminate. I don't mean to say that 0 over 0 can never equal 1. What I mean is it's not always equal to 1. So when you get 0 over 0, you have to turn to one of these new methods that we're working on now. This last one is going to save you time just to memorize. Okay, so sine x over x is 1. 1 minus cosine x over x is 0. And these are the ones that cause a lot of problems because it's just sometimes hard to recognize them in a, in, in a uh, practice problem. So look out for these. When you see a sine or a 1 minus cosine on top, it's a good um, indicator that you're probably using one of these special limits. An example of how you can use this first one is a problem like sine of 4x over x. And I know that this doesn't match perfectly. Um, these, these two things, they don't have to be just x's. They could be anything, but they do need to be the same. So what I need to do in a problem like this is multiply top and bottom by 4. Now I don't change anything by multiplying top and bottom by 4. But what I create is this, 4 sine 4x over 4x. And remember, this, like I said, this, this expression here, sine of whatever over whatever, those two things don't have to be x's, but they do have to match. And once they match, now I'm in a good spot, because I can take all of this portion and say that equals 1. This right here obviously equals 4 so I end up with 4 times 1 or just 4. Alright, we'll do more examples like those but just look for these special two, two special trig limits and memorize those because they're going to pop up and they can be the trickiest ones to find even though we don't really have to do many steps. Alright, here's just a quick picture to wrap it up. Sine x over x goes through the point zero, 01. It doesn't actually go through the point. We have our open circle, but I just wanted you to, again, reinforce what you're hearing with a picture. Here is 1 minus cosine over x. The limit of this one is 0. Because I get closer and closer to 0, I get closer and closer to a height of 0. It goes right through the origin. That's where the open circle is. It's undefined, but according to our two special trig limits, which we're going to memorize, this limit is equal to zero.